You're listening to the Good Dirt Podcast. This is a place where we dig into the nitty gritty of sustainable living through food, fashion, and lifestyle. And we're your hosts, Mary and Emma Kingsley, the mother and daughter founder team of Lady Farmer. We're sowing seeds of slow living through our community platform, events, and online marketplace. We started this podcast as a means to share the wealth of information and quality conversations that we're having in our world as we dream up and deliver ways for each of us to live into the new paradigm, one that is regenerative, balanced, and whole. We want to put the microphone in front of the voices that need to be heard the most right now, the farmers, the dreamers, the designers, and the doers. So come cultivate a better world with us. We're so glad you're here. Now, let's dig in. Hello, everybody. Welcome to part two of our bonus episode on the slow and sustainable kitchen. So in part one, we talked about the actual food you want to bring into your slow kitchen, the sourcing, including packaging considerations and storage. And just to review a bit about what we talked about, of course, we emphasize local food as being ideal, but also how in reality, like it or not, we're all immersed in this large industrial food production and distribution system, which admittedly has many problems. But I think it's useful to point out here that it is what we have. And in many ways, it does serve to get food to a lot of people. And so our job as consumers is to be informed and to be discerning and make our best decisions from our position within that system and not from a place of rejecting it entirely. Because unless you're living in really rare circumstances, it just isn't an option. So in summary on the food sourcing and the packaging and so forth, ask yourself what are your goals and values and the kind of food you want on your plate and seek that information on how to obtain it and be open to creative solutions. So onward to part two in which we'll talk about food prep and equipment and how, in our experience, equipment turns to clutter or not and how that's different for everybody. So this should be a fun conversation. So hello, Emma. Welcome back to the Slow Kitchen Discussion. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Glad to be here. Yeah. So where should we start? Food prep. Yeah. So where we left off, we were chatting about food storage. Uh And so that kind of leads us into food prep. Okay, so you've sourced your food from wherever you have found, you feel great about, and you've brought it home from the grocery store, and you have figured out how to store it in your kitchen. And so now it's time to do something with it, which this is the interesting part about eating real whole food, Mm -hmm. is that it can, I think this is where people get tripped up, it can feel intimidating. If you have, for example a real whole pasture chicken from a local farm and you just bring home a chicken. At least it has been hopefully prepared for you in such a way that you're only dealing with the raw chicken. (laughs) You don't have to pluck out feathers or anything. But yeah, it's still a whole uncooked chicken and it might even be frozen. So that's not a quick microwave dinner there. That's a few different steps. And Speaking from my own personal experience, that can feel really intimidating and confusing. But our goal here is to demystify all of that and point out that it's really not that that hard. And in many cases, it's actually much simpler mm-hmm. than we think. And I'll use this opportunity to tell a quick anecdote. My dear friends, they won't mind that I'm telling this story, but they were visiting the farm, actually, Mom. I don't think you were in town, but we were all staying at the farm. And the fridge was full of amazing food from the CSA. You guys had left us lots of delicious things to eat, to prepare. And it was really so full of vegetables, bags of lettuce, jars of milk from the cow, uncooked meat that had been thawed, ready to go. And my good friend opens the door and she goes, there's nothing to eat. (laughs) And me and my other friend were laughing and we were like, that is... There's a lot of things to eat in there. What she meant was 
how we're used to opening the refrigerator or the pantry Mm -hmm. when we're bored or whatever it is and just grabbing the thing straight from fridge into our mouth. Yes. Um, And may I add, I think typically we'd open our refrigerators and there's little plastic containers of stuff like yogurt, hummus, cottage cheese, all these things that we get from the store in their own containers and put them in there and ready to eat. That is the way that Americans eat. And we're not saying it's bad, just saying there's another way to approach it that eliminates a lot of the problems, the the packaging ways, the nutrition considerations. So anyway, we're just suggesting here that there are other ways to do it, and this is how we do it. Yes, and then I will also add that at some point, you do get to a point where you can open the fridge. And for me, it's in leftovers. I only need to make a couple, honestly, mm-hmm. sometimes even just two meals a week. And I can eat on them the whole rest of the week. If you chop up vegetables or prepare a salad or a slaw with the fresh vegetables, it'll keep for a while in your fridge. And it turns into one of those foods that you can just open the fridge and grab. So Exactly. And I can tell you how I take some dried garbanzo beans and just a few think ahead steps and then I open my refrigerator and there's a beautiful jar of hummus there ready to go so yeah it's it's just a shift in approach really yeah so maybe let's see without having to turn this into a three or four part (laughs) yeah um maybe the biggest hurdle that we faced in figuring this out which I can guarantee you takes a lot of trial and error and takes a few different times of feeling like you're wasting amazing food from the CSA and you're like, I really got to figure this out. So why don't we each pick a couple of our favorite easy prep food? I can start. Okay. Because I already mentioned it. I'm going to talk about the chicken. Good. First of all, I have found it difficult to source a beautiful whole pastured chicken when I'm not getting it from the farm that we subscribe to. So if you can find one of these, great. I don't know, Mom, do you know? Do grocery stores carry like a whole chicken? I'm sure you can ask for I one. I think some of the smaller grocers might get them locally. And yeah. I, yeah, you can find them. We have bought them before from a store. A whole chicken, while can seem really inconvenient because you have to like do a lot of things to it, is going to be, especially if it's sourced well, it's going to be just... It's like the goose that lays the golden egg. Like it just keeps giving you (laughs) food. You can have so many meals from it. What I do is it comes frozen from the farm. So I do need to thaw it. And it does have to thaw in the fridge for a couple of days. So again, slow food. Mm -hmm. It takes a minute. But as soon as I get home from the farm, it goes straight to the fridge and not the freezer. So it can thaw. After two to three days, it's all the way thawed. If I'm in more of a hurry, you can submerge it in water. It'll thaw a little faster. So... It's so easy, you guys. I take it out. It does come in plastic because a lot of times, for various health code reasons, the the fresh meat that is butchered does need to be vacuum sealed in plastic. So I'll cut off the plastic and rinse it in the sink. Not even that yucky. And then I will put salt on it. Are you ready? And some pepper. And I'll put it in a Dutch oven. And depending on what other veggies I have from the farm, usually it's potatoes, onions, because we're in winter right now, garlic. In the summer, this will look like tomatoes, carrots, peppers, but I'll just cut up a bunch of the, the veggies that I have and arrange them around the chicken, and then drizzle olive oil, a little bit more salt and pepper, some herbs if I want. This takes about three and a half minutes. And then put it in the oven at 325 350 for two to three hours and then about 20 minutes or so before it's done I'll take the top off I'm sorry did I say Dutch oven I like it in the Dutch oven so I'll take the top off at the end so the skin can get a little crispy on the top and then it's ready and you know what it's a whole dinner there because you have your veggies and your chicken and then try to have some good bread on hand really the only other thing you need maybe some rice for a grain okay so then you have your amazing delicious roast chicken dinner with your roast vegetables and then what other whatever meat you didn't have 
for dinner with your dinner. You just get it off the bone, put it in little your glass or whatever storage container <laughs> for your leftovers, and you have really delicious cut up prepared roast chicken that you can use. Honestly, I usually just eat that for the next few days for lunches, put them on a sandwich. If I'm feeling fancy, I might make a little chicken salad out of it. Also takes three minutes. But usually, I'm, I don't even do that because I'm so lazy. <laughs> I just put chicken in a thing and have it as leftover. And then with the carcass, and you don't have to do this right away also. Like sometimes I just put, put the carcass back in the fridge for when I'm ready, maybe the next day, to make to do what I'm going to tell you. But the next day, you pull the carcass out and the veggies and anything else, doesn't matter what's in there, all the juices, and you just fill the Dutch oven with water put it on the stove, boil it, turn it down to simmer after it's boiling, and let it simmer for several hours. And then you strain all of that out. And this is the worst part because you're like, what do I do with all this stuff? But once you strain the, the broth off, you I do this is what I do. I take a compost bag and bag up my chicken carcass and all of the veggie scraps and things. And then because my compost does not accept chicken carcasses, I do have to throw this bag away in the trash can. So that's the sad part. But I have gotten as much mileage as possible out of this chicken carcass and veggies. And I now have a beautiful thing of broth that then I can create, use as a base for soups. I can, I love making rice in this broth. It's like really tasty rice. I can freeze it for later. So there you go. That's like many meals out of one chicken. Yeah, it's just so exciting how many things you can do with this one beautiful frozen chicken. We do the same thing. We come home from the CSA, put it straight in the fridge. So you know, after a couple of days, it's ready to cook. And we might roast it in the oven. We might take it outside and roast it on the, the cooker. Or we might put it in the slow cooker and cook the whole thing. Then that's if I'm really out of time, I just plunk that thing in the slow cooker. And like you... Once it cools, I just love to pull all that chicken off and have the wonderful cooked chicken for so many things, which leads me to the recipe I wanted to share with you, that which, which takes us back to the hummus that I was just talking about. Also at the CSA, we get the dried garbanzo beans. So I will often, when I get home, take a couple of cups of those, soak them for 24, 36, 48 hours, however long, and and cook them. So I have the cooked garbanzo beans. So with half those garbanzo beans, I'll make a quick homemade hummus. So easy. Just a little tahini, garlic, salt, lemon juice, scallions, so many things you can put in there. A hundred variations of that recipe. Really quick. I do use a small food processor for that to whip it up and make it nice and smooth. Put it in the glass container, put it in the fridge, and there you go. There's the hummus. You open your fridge, and there's something to snack on right there. With the other half of the garbanzo beans, I love to add that cooked chicken in there and some maybe whatever greens I have in t on hand, maybe some chopped raw kale, parsley, just any kind of green, give it color. And this time of year in spring, when the chickweed out in the yard is flourishing, most of you are probably surrounded with chickweed and you don't even realize it. But if you are able to 100% identify chickweed that you have out there that you can forage that's not around animals or pesticides or all of those responsible foraging considerations, allergies, all that stuff. If you can identify the chickweed for sure and you know it's okay to eat, I love to chop up a little chickweed, add it to the whole garbanzo beans, and put this chicken in there, add some onion, scallions, you know, whatever dressing you choose, let it sit for a couple hours, and you have a delicious spring, healthy, meatless salad. And I call it my three chick salad because it's the chickweed, chickpeas. And chicken. That's cute. Isn't, isn't that cute? It's one of my That's favorite spring cute. dishes. And 
So there you go. That chicken, just the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. And I just want to point out, especially because I do spend too much time on TikTok and so I'm well aware of this discourse around right now there's this thing where a lot of content creators are getting on and saying, oh, Oreo cookies? I'm going to make them from scratch. It's like a whole video about how you make Oreo cookies from scratch. And it's they're really interesting videos to watch. And they also, of course, get a lot of backlash because it's ridiculous. Oh, I'm going to make this from scratch because they take so long and they require crazy ingredients and et cetera, et cetera. I want to point out that this can seem like that, but it really isn't. It's really... The work is in the sourcing Mm -hmm. and the storing. If you have a source and you have a way that you can bring it into your home and and a place to put it, the preparation is actually quite simple and quite quick. I don't even have to think about this roast chicken dinner, and it creates five meals. And sure, there's a few steps in between, but no, I'm not opening a bag or a box and adding water and boiling. I am doing it from scratch, but... I just want to say that even though it is slow, from scratch doesn't necessarily mean that it has to take all day and that you can't do this if you have a full-time job. And it might take a little time to figure out how to make it work in your day and how to fit it in. The actual time spent on it is not that much. It's a little bit like some people might be able to understand if you are a baker or if you got into sourdough, how, sure, sourdough, it takes a long time because it has to ferment and rise. But the time that you're actually spent doing the sourdough, whether it's kneading it or mixing it, is very minimal compared to the payoff, Mm -hmm. just to make that distinction. Yeah, also compared to driving and parking and shopping. and Yes, that too, that we've just sort of, normalized as things we have to do exactly I think that's a great place to um, take everything we've just described with the chicken and point out how once you learn to do these things one thing leads to another and Mm -hmm. a prep for one thing becomes prep for another thing as you just described you took that chicken all the way through several meals and you ended up with broth so Mm -hmm. now you have the broth which is the ideal basis for infinite varieties of soup and when you are sourcing fresh produce you've got all kinds of vegetable summer winter whatever the season and you can make soup with it and and put your chicken in it and your your chicken in your your chicken that you pulled off the roast chicken and i'm not even gonna give recipes because that everybody has their recipe for vegetable soup or you can look one up or make it up you want to cook vegetables in broth there you go that is vegetable soup and also vegetables that could go in egg dishes egg casserole these things that can be prepared eaten over several days or leftovers frozen or you divide it up and freeze one and eat the other just is a wonderful time saving simple way to be eating real food definitely and speaking of time saving and simple the better quality of food that you're sourcing that's why it all starts there the less you have to do to it for example the chicken and the vegetables that we're referring to truly just need to be heated up to be a safe temperature to eat And maybe seasoned a little bit. Salt and pepper. And that's been our experience with most of the food that we get at the CSA. Sure, you can cook amazing complicated dishes and combine lots of things together. But cooking is actually quite simple if you have real food. Yes, and I have a little story to tell about that. So we had some out-of-town guests for a few days. And when they left, our guest said to me, I want to learn to eat like this. And... I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, uh, you just take your food and you do something really quick with it and you eat it. And it's what you just said, Emma. You've got kale. You've got a potato. You've got squash. You've got these things. You can roast them. You can bake them. Stir fry. So when you open your refrigerator and you see these things in it, 
there might not be processed food to get out of a plastic thing, but there is food that you can take out and do something very quick and simple with, such as stick that potato in the oven, cut that squash in half, stick it on a baking pan and put it in the oven, roast those veggies, carrots, beets, so forth, and you have a meal. And not much has happened to that food between its original state out of the ground and your plate. So I think about that a lot about our guests saying, I want to eat like this. And when we say, what do you want to do for dinner? I say, well, I can cook that fish and I have this, the kale and sweet potato with it. And all of this happens within a few minutes. And often we say, what a great meal. And it was just all like really simple food, very close to its normal state. So we feel very grateful and satisfied and happy to be eating this way and very little packaging and plastic and waste involved love it and just as one more little add-on to like favorite recipes and ways to prepare this food just because I mentioned it in part one the salad that I was making for lunch at the time yes that you taught me how to manage and make it delicious this kale the kale that we get from the CSA is really good but you can get kale anywhere, of course. So however you've sourced your kale, it is probably a little tough and hard to eat. It's cruciferous. Is that the word? Cruciferous? And I believe. You, you do have to do things to kale. You can't just eat raw kale. You could, but it's not particularly delicious. But all you did, all I had the salad first at your house, and then I was like, I'm going to do that at my house. Just tear up the kale so you take the middle parts out because those are too woody to eat. I also chopped up some cabbage, just some regular cabbage that is also really tough and hard to eat raw. And I put salt on it, just salt, and massaged it for a little bit and let it sit. And then put a little bit of olive oil on it. And it was like the best salty, oily, delicious salad. So filling. It was so easy. So easy and so nutritious. Yeah. About fiber. And if you have any of those chickpeas left over, run those in. Ow. (laughs) And I just, I get so intimidated by salads because I think I need all to put all this stuff in it to make it good. I need the cheese and the nuts and the dried fruit and the shredded carrots and the, and you just really don't, you just don't need it. You can just eat kale. So true. It can just be kale with a little bit of salt and olive oil, a little bit of lemon. Absolutely. One, two, three ingredients, whatever. And I always plant lots of the butter crunch lettuce in the spring. And when they're mature, you just go out and cut off the whole head at the ground and come in and you put it in a bowl and you drizzle this your delicious vinaigrette on top of that. And you have the most delicious salad. It's two ingredients. It's the butter crunch lettuce and the dressing. Oh, it is so good. Yeah. So simple. You also do your summer slaw. Oh, yes. With, we share the recipe far and wide. We can link it in the show notes. But that is, just tell them how you do that. And that lasts forever. Yes. Not really because you eat it. But Cannot can. leave this discussion without talking about f- simple fermenting. That's it's, true, yes. It's a real foundation in my slow kitchen where you take almost any vegetable and you put it in a, a brine with basically water and salt. You can do one ingredient. You can do many ingredients. There's so many recipes for this, so many possibilities, so many resources, including our website. And we have had workshops and all kinds of stuff on really basic fermenting. So I won't go too much into it here. But basically, it's you put something in a salt brine and you let it sit and ferment for a few days, depending on what it is. And you let it ferment to taste. Like you can taste it and say, that's about right. Stick it in the fridge and you've got something to eat for months. You can open your refrigerator and there is a jar of fermented carrots, what we call fermented slaw, beets, dilly beans in the summer, so many things. So yeah, that's prepared processed food that you've done yourself. No plastic Uh, and highly nutritious, fresh local from your garden farmer's market whatever and it's an easy way to use up that produce believe me even after saying all of this i know what it feels like to have a a basket full of fresh vegetables on your counter like oh 
I've got to do something with these. Mm -hmm. It's an easy way to make sure you're using them without feeling bad about wasting them. Just cut them up and put them in salt water, literally. Well, there are proportions. If you're beginning to learn about fermentation, yes, do consult some sources on the the procedure. Very simple. And once you get the knack of it, you'll think, why haven't I been doing this forever? <laughs> so it's really fun, really delicious. And yeah, so fermentation for your sustainable kitchen. While we're on fermentation, although we do need to move on at some point, yes. <laughs> we'll just mention that two other sort of staple foods that we both have in our house besides the fermented veg is sourdough bread and kefir. And again, two really amazing foods that we have lots of resources and recipes on in our arsenal, Lady Farmer Almanac Arsenal. But just to say that a sourdough, to, to keep a sourdough starter, it's not that complicated. It can live dormant in your refrigerator for a very long time. Mm -hmm. It's very simple to mix up and have fresh bread whenever you would like it. And then similarly with the kefir, I can't say I am as prolific at the kefir as you are, mom, but it is truly a, a staple in your life. It is. And I've been making it years and years. And, and for anyone who doesn't know, kefir is fermented milk. It sounds crazy, mm -hmm. but it's a really amazing, nutritious, ancient drink that is so tasty. And you can add all sorts of fun flavors to it. And it's like dessert and breakfast all in one. Or a it's meal. Really yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to speak to the sourdough thing. And as we all know, everybody, not, not everybody, but lots of people went through a sourdough thing during COVID and learned about it and whether or not you continued it. I would just like to encourage people that even though life is returned to normal and now you're going after the office, the kids are at school and whatever, you might think you don't have the time to do that. But I'm here to tell you that once you get in the rhythm with that, like on Sunday night is when I'm going to feed my starter or whatever, whatever your schedule might be. Once you get in the rhythm of it, you'll spoil yourself and you'll realize that what you end up getting your own homemade bread has all the of course all the nutrition benefits but again it it the packaging and the shopping and the storage and we mentioned in part one of this how when we make our own sourdough bread we let it cool and we slice it into the size of slices we want and then pop those slices in the freezer so we can just take it out as we use it like one piece at a time I like to have a piece of toast when I first wake up in the morning I just go to the freezer and pop out a slice and stick it in the toaster and there you go. So that kind of leads us into the equipment, doesn't it? Talking about the bread slicer. Totally. Yeah. It sure does. Yeah. My husband found sourced. It's really cute. Bread slicer that we just stick the loaf down in it and you can pick your size of the slice and it lines it up so you can just put your knife down through it and you get these beautiful even slices. So oh, we will link that. It's really, it's low tech, simple, beautiful. Love it. We'll link that. I have one of the, I have the bread slicer that looks like a bow. Oh. Like a, you know, literally like a bow that you would play a violin with. I've seen that. But it's like a serrated knife and it cuts very evenly. So it's not, I'm not doing it all at once, but to cut slices off things, it's great for like bagels too. So yeah, I will also you recommend that. link that one. But yeah, so that's bread. Bread and, slicer. And <laughs> bread slicer. And we talked a little bit about, this is technically the storage category, but storing our bread in linen or cloth bags yes. in the freezer after slicing is a great way to make your bread go really far and keep it fresh. I have to say that one of my favorite and most frequently used pieces of equipment in my kitchen is the hand blender. The immersion blender. I guess you can call it either thing. I use it many times a day. I love that thing. So, yeah, it's an electric gadget, but boy, do I use it and I mix my kefir up with it. I when I'm doing my my sort of coffee mocha thing, I froth it up. If you're making a recipe, yeah. a lot of times I'll make a soup or some kind of recipe that requires like. Literally, I'll be cooking it in the Dutch oven or in a pot, and it says 
in two parts, move this to the food processor, yeah. combine and put it back. And it's like this whole thing. And it's literally, it, all you have to do is put the immersion blender in the thing that you're cooking yeah. to blend it up. It really is. I understand how it can seem like an extra thing that you might not need, but it truly it doesn't fully replace a food processor and a blender. But it can do a lot, if not most of the things that you would use a food processor and a blender for. Yes. And the puree thing with all kinds of soups or Mm -hmm. partially pureed or you just want something a little creamy, but you still want to have chunky vegetables. Mm -hmm. It's just perfect for all that. And you can stick it down in hot liquid. Yeah, it's just. I make smoothies with it. Love, love the immersion blender. Yeah. So. (laughs) Another thing I love in my kitchen that we've had for years uh, is uh, the Chemex coffee maker, coffee dripper. Love that. And you guys have a really cool, like, automatic one. <laughs> you can purchase an automatic one that times out the water and keeps it heated and it's on the hot plate. So that's a really fun way to automate a slow coffee process. But you don't need it. I had a hand chemex for many years where i you pour the slow yeah. pour over coffee lovely it, my coffee maker is a little bit more high tech but i love it so much it's actually a full espresso maker it makes all kinds of espresso drinks there you go nothing too slow about that but you do what you can absolutely other things that i love i, I just love my wooden spoons big wooden stirring spoons and I try to move away from the the spatulas and things with the plastic on them because I don't want plastic and heat coming together in my food. So I'm, I've moved as much as possible to wooden utensils. Yeah. Related cast iron, if you don't already cook oh, yeah. on cast iron, is great to cook on. And just in general, being aware of nonstick and aluminum to cook on just the transfer of heat through those different materials can be yucky we're not even sure all of the different chemicals and the effects of that but cast iron is always a good option yes good point emma and i'm trying to think sometimes i think about if i were going to move to a tiny cabin or like some place where it just had the very smallest kitchen space what would be the things that I would have to have and um and we've mostly set it a few cast iron pans wooden utensils oh a kettle to heat hot water and in my book it's worth it to have an electric kettle because it goes a lot faster I agree I agree I know we're talking about slow living but yeah and I think it probably also saves energy rather than using the heat on your stove for several minutes to heat the water that versus just a few seconds so love that the tea kettle love love the immersion blender yes what else i really enjoy my large pyrex eight cup measuring cups i use those an amazing amount i use those too i use them to bake when i'm baking as a mixing bowl yeah it's usually big enough for whatever you're mixing and it really saves on things you have to wash when you're done mixing because you can measure stuff in there yeah The last thing that we haven't really talked about is the slow cooker. Oh, yeah. So you guys have a slow cooker specific brand that you really like, and then we use a different one. We were gifted this. I'm not sure I would necessarily pick it out at the store, but we do use it all the time. It's a Ninja Foodie, and so it's actually a slow cooker and a pressure cooker and an air fryer all in one, and it's quite large. It takes up a lot of room on the counter. But we do have this sort of dead corner in our kitchen that we can't really use for much else because it's hard to reach. So it lives in that spot where it's not like it's taking up room that would otherwise be used. And we make our dog's food in it. So we do use it constantly. And then we also do cook our meals, some meals in it. I like this specific gadget, even though it's very gadgety, because you can like roast potatoes in the base and then there's a little rack and you can also crisp up like a steak or a piece of salmon all at the same time. Yeah, I don't know if that's it's a bit particularly slow food, but it is a great gadget that we do use and it's to prepare our simple food that we have sourced well. 
makes things very quick and easy. Yes. And a um, few years ago, I went down a rabbit hole on the slow cooker, which was the best one. At one point, there was some discussion about the ceramic ones and whether or not they were leaching lead and how much lead. And I don't know. I don't know about that. But we ended up going with the Vita clay. It's a slow cooker that's literally made out of clay. And I have found that really works well for us. We cook all kinds of things in it. We even had a couple of them. One of them is more like for cooking rice and so forth. And the other one more for like slow cooking the chicken or meat or. So we love the Vita clay and are still using it. And yeah, it, we use it almost daily. We make the dog food in it as well. And you might go, ew, dog food, but the dog eats the same food we do. It eats like turkey and rice. Yeah, meat, My dog rice, too. vegetables. And this is not because we, I just want to say, disclaimer, it's not because we're insistent on them eating real food. It's for both of them. They have high, highly high maintenance <laughs> digestive issues. Yeah. So that's what led us to the making their own food. I would, I, for convenience sake, it would be nice if I could just feed my dog kibble. But first of all, that's not great for them. And, and it really, she just doesn't keep it down. So that's what that is. <laughs> right. Same. And the same process with cooking your own food, you know, you get in a rhythm of it mm-hmm. and it's just part of the routine and it turns out to be way cheaper, way cheaper. Now, I don't know about, I could probably get some big old giant bag of bargain bonanza kibble or something, but um, she's not going to do well on that. So. This yeah. works. It reminds me when I lived in France and with a host family when I was in college, my French host mother would work all day and then come home and make a beautiful, delicious meal and then clean up the kitchen and bake a loaf of bread. And once a week she would have she would do yogurt. And so there was always, every day, there was fresh bread, and in the refrigerator, there was fresh yogurt for the week that she had made, in addition to her, the meal every day. And I just remember being, like, fascinated. (laughs) How does she do all that? But she was, it was just chill. It was normal. She, like, also hung out with us and was generally relaxed. But when you said, you know, you work it into your routine and you get into a rhythm, I noticed that's what was happening. While she was cleaning up the kitchen, she was also mixing up the bread and putting it on the... She also had the cool bread maker thing. You you do have appliances to make your life easier if you use them. Um, That's another thing we wanted to say is like a lot of times we can get tempted by appliances and gadgets that we think will make things a lot easier, but sometimes they just take up more space and create more work. So being really like cognizant of that and trying things out. And if you're not using it, get it out of your kitchen. Um, But yes, all that to say, it's amazing what you can do. Yeah, I think just like everything else, it's a shift in mindset, a shift in attitude, and the stories we tell ourselves about what we can and can't do or things we have time for or not. Like we've said a couple of times here, go into the store parking, shopping, lugging, all of that takes time. And you just trade one activity out for another. You just decide you're going to try it and just see how these things work for you. Yeah. I think we can wind it up. I cannot believe how much we had to say on this. I know. And when we first thought about doing this episode, we were like, what are we going to (laughs) say? So this has been fun. Really glad we broke it into two parts. Yeah. And we hope that you found this helpful and useful. And we would love to hear from you and your slow kitchen tips and tricks and how you do slow food in your kitchen at home. Feel free to call us and leave a voicemail or write in or contact us on Instagram at We Are Lady Farmer. And we're just so excited to hear from you. And we hope that you found this helpful okay thanks for listening goodbye everybody goodbye thank you for tuning in calling in and spreading the good dirt we love hearing from you 
You can reach our listener voicemail at 443-459-1950. That's 443-459-1950. You can find this number in our show notes and in our Instagram profile. This show is produced by Lady Farmer, a slow living lifestyle community. And the original music is composed and performed by John Kingsley. For more from Lady Farmer, follow us on Instagram at We Are Lady Farmer. That's We Are Lady Farmer. Or join us online at www.ladyfarmer.com. We'll see you next time on The Good Dirt. Goodbye. Goodbye.